Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave. Welcome to Mosaic. I'm so glad that you're with us today. I want to tell you a quick story. In 1955, there was a woman. Uh, she lived in Kansas in America. Her name was uh, Elizabeth Henson. Uh, and one day she was clearing out her, her basement, all her old things, and, and she found among her stuff, she found an old green coat that I guess she used to wear many years prior to this. And she found this old green coat and, and she said to herself, I, I didn't know I still had this. This is so out of fashion, this old green, worn out, dirty green coat. Uh, I'm never going to wear this again. Why do I still have this? I'm just going to throw this out. And so she went to throw this out and then her son uh, sees her and, and she says, Mom, where are you going to go take that green coat? Uh, and she said, I'm going to throw it out. And, and, and he says, can I have it? And mom goes, well, what do you want to do with this green coat? It's useless. It, it's, it's worn out. We don't need this anymore. Uh, but sure, I don't need it. If, if you want it, you can have it. And so uh, she gives the green coat, this useless, worn out, out of fashion green coat. She gives it to her son. And her son takes it and goes into his bedroom and starts to actually cut it up and uh, stitch it back together in a whole different way. And he actually uh, takes a ping pong ball and cuts it in two and also stitches that on there. And that useless green coat actually went on and it won an Oscar. Uh, it had a hit single on the radio. It had a TV show that went on for decades. It also had a celebrity love affair with the most beautiful pick on the planet. <laughs> in the hands of Jim Henson, the son, Jim Hen in the hands of Jim Henson, this useless green coat became Kermit the Frog. <laughs> Kermit the Frog. Jim Henson had an ability to see what that useless coat could become. He, he, he could see beyond what it was to what it could be. And so he remade it. And friends, that is exactly the story that Jesus wants to write with every one of us today. He wants to remake us. Today we are starting a new series called Waymaker. We're going to look at the ways of Jesus, Waymaker. For the next six weeks, we're going to look at six different stories, uh, six different actually people in the Bible who had an encounter with Jesus. And they're all very different people. They all have their own stories, their own lives. It's not that they're the copy-paste stories. They're very different uh, stories, very different people. They have one thing in common. They each have something in their lives uh, that I guess helps the, that, that held them back from Jesus. Something that made them feel like, ah, I'm, I'm a useless green coat. <laughs> I can't come to this Jesus. Something that, a barrier that they had. And every single time we're going to see how Jesus actually was able to build a bridge over that barrier to their hearts. That's what we want to do. We're going to look at these stories and look at barriers and bridges. Now, maybe you have uh, figured this out already. The people in Berlin, your friends, your co-workers, your neighbors, uh, the people who are maybe uninterested in church, they have all kinds of different barriers, different reasons why they don't believe in God like we do. You know, they're not, they're not all of the same reasons. You know, they're all different, of course. You know, one person might say, I, I can't believe that. I looked at the reasons, I looked at the arguments. It just doesn't make sense to me. I can't believe in God. Another person says maybe, well, I don't want to believe. I don't want to believe in a God who fill in the blank. And they refuse it. A third person says, I, I can't believe anymore. Now that's different as well. I can't believe anymore. It means maybe something happened to that person. Maybe something painful. And they just, I, I can't believe. I don't know if I can believe this anymore. And a fourth person might say, <laughs> Uh, I don't want to believe what they believe. I don't want to be associated with the Christians and the church. I don't want to be part of that. Thank you very much. You see, there's, there's so many different reasons why people may not believe in God. And nobody likes to be put in a box. Let's not put people in a box. Because when we do that, it just causes all kinds of problems. Just switch on your television and watch the news. What's happening around the world in the last well week or so. Uh, nobody likes to be put in a box Jesus never labeled anybody. He just didn't. He, he didn't put people in boxes. He always saw the dignity and the worth 
of the individual. He always found a way, an individual way, to build bridges where there were barriers. He really is the way maker. What I hope we will discover together is that Jesus is the way to the Father, but that there are a thousand ways to Jesus. There are a thousand ways to Jesus. And so we're going to go on this journey together for the next weeks. And we want to get to know the ways of Jesus, the way maker. And uh, I hope you're up for this. My, my prayer for you, for us, is that we'll get to learn from him, that we will get to learn from him what it means to be um, the people of grace. That's, that's what we want to be at Mosaic, people of grace uh, who look like Jesus. And so today we're going to start in Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, this is about 10 days before Jesus went to die on the cross. So I want to ask you this. What would you do if you knew you had only 10 days to live? Have you ever thought about this? What would you do? How would you spend your days, your last 10 days on this planet, I guess? What would you do if you only had 10 days left to live? You know, off the top of my head, I thought, well, I would eat steak every day. I would drink cocktails every day. And I would try to spend as much time as possible with my closest family and my closest friends. That's what came to my mind. <laughs> Maybe travel, although what's the point, you know? Well, what did Jesus do? He knew he was about to go to the cross, but he still goes out. Even though he knows I have 10 days left, he still goes out to befriend a man who is hated by everyone. Let's look at this story now. Hi everyone, my name is Jamilia, and today we're reading Luke 19 verses 1 through 10. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor Lord, and if I have cheated people in their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. The title of this preach today is Hide and Seek. Hide and Seek, like the kids game. You know, because this story looks a little bit like a kid's game, doesn't it? Here's a tax collector who's running down the streets and then he's hiding in a tree. And then a rabbi, Jesus, he comes along, uh, he, and he comes along to seek and to find him. Hide and seek. <laughs> well, in order for us to understand this story, we really need to understand who this guy, who Zacchaeus was. Let me read this again, verse 2. It says, there was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he had become very rich. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know anybody who gets very excited about paying taxes. <laughs> Nobody gets excited to pay taxes, but most of us, I, I hope most of us, we kind of conclude, well, you know, our system isn't perfect, but it's serving us well. And so, you know, we got to pay the tax. Let's, we, we just have to do this, you know. Now, in Jesus' day, it wasn't a system that served people. It was a system that exploited people. You know, the Romans had conquered the land. They had invaded the land and they were oppressive. They were forceful. They were cruel. And they had demanded taxes to be paid to Rome. Uh, not into the system, but money that would go to Rome. And, um, and the taxes that they had, they weren't even reasonable taxes. They were enormous taxes. And the tax collectors, those who would collect the taxes, were Jewish people who worked for Rome. Jewish people who worked for Rome. And they were, if you think about this, it makes sense. They were hated by everyone because they were seen as, 
hey, you're, you're with the enemy. You're a traitor. What are you doing taking our money and giving it to the enemy, our oppressors? Doesn't make sense. You know, that's why they were hated. And, and the Romans, what they actually said to the tax collectors is, hey, you can take whatever tax you want, whatever amount you want. If you want to do 5%, 15%, 20%, 50%, 75%, that's up to you as long as you get us our quota per citizen, whatever surplus you have is yours to keep. And so you can see what happened. The tax collectors, they took way more than they were actually asked to take by the Romans and they kept a lot of money, a lot of money for themselves as well. They took from their own people uh, to then be able to afford a very grandiose lifestyle. So they were traitors, they, they were thieves, they were... Uh, dishonest and also we, we were told that this was in Jericho. Now Jericho was uh, quite a rich city at that time. Uh, it was also where King uh, Herod had his kind of his winter palace and so there were a lot of traders coming in and out, lots of taxes to be paid. Uh, also near Jericho um, uh, there, there were these uh, balsam trees, these groves um, with, that produce these herbs and stuff that were actually used for worship, for funerals and for, for you know, the smoke and the temple and all these things, you know, they, for, for, rich, for religious rituals, for worship. And there's no doubt in my mind that Zacchaeus made the worship of God part of his business because that's how people had to pay tax in that region. That's how he became rich. He made money off the worship for God. No wonder the religious leaders were saying these tax collectors, they are sinners. They're making money out of the worship that is intended for God. So Jericho was quite a lucrative place uh, to be a tax collector. And Zacchaeus, he was the chief tax collector. Uh, so he was kind of over, he was a supervisor. No doubt he lived in one of the finest villas in Jericho. And uh, there was not one person in Jericho who uh, would identify as a friend or a fan of Zacchaeus. He didn't have anybody. He was a loner. He was rich, but he didn't have any friends. And so I think he was quite a nasty guy, a dishonest guy. You know, people would see his house or, or they would see him walk down the streets with, I don't know, fine clothes or a big belly or, you know, an arrogant smile. And they would just think to themselves or maybe even shout at him. It's like, hey, Zacchaeus, who paid for all of this? Who paid for this? We did. We did. And they would just try to rub it in because it was so unjust. Have you ever wondered, this Zacchaeus guy, have you ever wondered how he got to be a tax collector? Like, what made him do it? You know, the text doesn't tell us this, so I'm just assuming things here. But, you know, how did Zacchaeus get into this business? I, I doubt it was his dream job when he was a child. It was like, oh, one day I'm going to betray all my people and swear allegiance to Rome and be very rich and have no friends. <laughs> I, I, doubt he, I doubt that was his dream. But, you know, it's good when, when people are irritating to us, we, know, we shouldn't ask, hey, what's wrong with you? <laughs> the better question to ask is, what, what happened to you? What happened to you? Why are you so irritating? And so what happened to Zacchaeus? You know, I wonder, maybe he was bullied in school. I'm just assuming. Maybe he was bullied in school because he was a small kid. The text tells us he was a small man. Maybe he was bullied because all of his classmates, they were making fun of him and they mocked him and they ridiculed him and, and, uh, and he, became, he, was, he was hurt and then he became bitter and then he became angry. And then he said, he resolved one day, I'm going to have my revenge. One day I'm going to make them pay. I'm going to make you all pay. Maybe you've heard this saying, hurt people, hurt people. People who, are, who have been hurt are hurtful. Hurt people hurt people. And I wonder if that's what happened to Zacchaeus. Because I know every person has a desire, a longing to be loved and to be accepted. And I think Zacchaeus, he was just desperate for all of this. But he went about it in the whole completely uh, wrong way. I don't know if that's the case. I'm just, that's speculation. And even if it were, 
it would explain it, but it wouldn't excuse it. Hello, don't just take the money, uh, you know, don't, don't steal from your people, Zacchaeus. That's not right. That's not just. You shouldn't have been doing this. So anyways, we don't know why. We don't know how he became a tax collector. Look at verse 3 with me. Uh, it says, he tried to get a look at Jesus. Zacchaeus tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. So Jesus was walking through Jericho, uh, doing what he always did. You know, encouraging people, blessing people, teaching people, healing people, all of these things. Uh, and, and Zacchaeus wanted to get a look at Jesus. He wanted to get to Jesus, but he had these barriers <laughs> that kept him away from Jesus. Now, it wasn't just his size. The problem that he had was the crowd that was in his way. <laughs> the crowd that didn't let him past that didn't let him through you know and we know why they didn't let him through you know they looked they didn't like him they looked at him was like no 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 favors no favors for traitors you, let's keep that guy away from jesus <laughs> that's what they did you know sometimes the crowds can keep people away from jesus you know in, in all kinds of ways you know you know, maybe someone says, uh, you know, the peer pressure thing. You know, I, I, I would go to church, but uh, I'm not sure if my friends, <laughs> what they would think of all of this. And, and so I better don't. The crowds keep me away from Jesus. But, you know, tragically, sometimes it is the Christian crowd, the religious crowd that keeps people away from Jesus. You know, where maybe the people within the church where, where we kind of try to keep certain people out of the church. Now, we're not actually closing the door on someone, but in the way we sometimes talk um, about people outside the church, about their lifestyles, about their choices, the way we talk about this keeps people out of the church. The crowd within the church can keep people away from Jesus. So the crowd was one barrier, and the other barrier, that, the obvious barrier that Zacchaeus had was also his condition, <laughs> his condition as a tax collector. Zacchaeus, he knew how he got rich. He, he knew that he wasn't an honorable man. He knew he wasn't an honest man. He knew who he was. And have you see, seen this in the text? It doesn't say he tried to meet Jesus. It actually says he tried to get a look at Jesus. He just wanted to see the guy. Uh, and uh, he didn't try to meet him. What if the people that we think want nothing to do with God, actually, what if they believe that God wants nothing to do with them? Let me ask this again. What if the people that we think they want nothing to do with God, what if in reality or secretly they believe God wants nothing to do with them? Well, he thought he, uh, he was unqualified uh, to actually meet Jesus. He, he wasn't perfect. He wasn't spiritual enough. And so he just wanted to have a look at him. He didn't actually want to meet him. He knew he probably couldn't. Or so he thought. <laughs> because what he didn't know is that Jesus is a way maker. And that Jesus had a mission. To came, he came and to, to save and seek the lost. And there's three things that Jesus did. And we're going to look at that in just a minute. But before we do, let's sing this song now of the way maker. The way maker who came to touch every heart, to heal every heart, to turn lives around. Let's sing together. Jesus is our way maker. Let's go back to our story. We see uh, this hide and seek game here. Uh, Zacchaeus is hiding in a tree and then Jesus comes along and he seeks him. And I think he does three things with and for Zacchaeus. Uh, if you want to write these down, let's write down the first. The first thing that Jesus did for Zacchaeus is he calls him by name. He calls him, he calls Zacchaeus by his name. Let's look at this in verse 5. It says, when Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Jesus saw Zacchaeus in the tree long before Zacchaeus saw Jesus in the crowd. He spotted him in the tree and then he called him by name. And you know, this reminds me uh, of when Jesus talked about himself as the great shepherd, the shepherd who, who looks after his flock in John chapter 10. Uh, and he actually says that the shepherd, he calls his own sheep by name. He calls them by name and he leads them out. 
You see, Jesus knew everything there was to know about Zacchaeus. He knew, and yet he had compassion on him. Yet he calls him by name. Yet he reached out to him. What a great picture of grace. And this picture is true for us as well, for you, for me. Jesus knows everything there is to know about you. And yet he loves you just the way you are. You are more loved than you ever dared to hope. And you know, then there were these bystanders in the crowd who saw that and they just looked at, hey, Jesus, what are you doing talking to him? What are you doing? And like, does he not know who this is? Like, why is he talking to Zacchaeus, the tax collector? And they were, they were upset because God's grace is so scandalous. Like, why is Jesus reaching out to the worst person in the entire town? There's two things here that I really love about Jesus. I hope you do too. There's two things here. The first thing I love about Jesus that I can see here is his lack of concern for his own reputation. He just doesn't care what the other people are saying. You know, in, um, in Matthew 11, there's a similar situation, uh, with another scenario. But then the people were saying that actually the religious people, they were saying about Jesus, they were saying, look at this glutton and drunkard. He is a friend of tax collectors and of sinners. And they wanted to insult him with this. They wanted to say he's a friend of sinners. But I think it's the greatest compliment for Jesus. He's a friend of sinners. Now, Jesus wasn't a glutton. He wasn't a drunkard. But he was hanging out with people who were these things. So he was guilty by association. And he didn't care. He just didn't care about it. Don't you hope that we as a church at Mosaic get criticized for these things? Look at these Christians. They're hanging out with the sinners. Look at these Christians. Look at, look at you know, and, and we're guilty by association. Oh, I would love if that's the case. So Jesus, I love about him that he, that he just didn't care about his reputation. And the other thing I love is his ability to see a crowd and spot the one person. Spot the individual. He looked at the one. He had a crowd of people in front of him, but he saw Zacchaeus in the tree. Jesus has an ability to see 99 sheep and he says, hold on, there's one missing. There's one missing. He's always looking for the one. Even when he's in the multitudes, when he's in the crowds, so many times in the Gospels we see this, how he's singling out the individual. He's always going after the one. And so he, he looks up and he calls Zacchaeus by name and he says, Zacchaeus. And I just imagine that Zacchaeus is on that tree And he just looks around and, do you mean me? <laughs> are you talking to me? And maybe Jesus went like, well, are there any other Zacchaeuses up on that tree? Of course I mean you, Zacchaeus. Come down here quickly. <laughs> and, you know, that's, that's just the beauty of it. Zacchaeus probably didn't even know that he was meant. That's how scandalous the grace is. That's how scandalous it was that Jesus called him by name. And maybe you're listening to all of this right now and you're saying, well, that sounds really pretty and romantic and all of that, but that is not for me. Because if, Dave, if you would know what I have done in my life, then you would have to change your message right now because that isn't for me. Listen, I don't care what you've done. I don't care who you've done it with. I don't care where you have been. Jesus is calling you by name today. He is, just like with Zacchaeus. Look at this in the story, in, in, chapter, in, in this chapter, in verse 5, it says, Jesus, he looked up at Zacchaeus and he called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house. And I love this, in great excitement, And joy, in great excitement and joy. Imagine how excited he was. I will have a guest in my house. I have a nice house. Never had a guest in my house. Jesus is coming to be a guest in my house. And he led him to his home. And um, I think that's already the second thing we can see that Jesus did. The first thing is he calls Zacchaeus by name. The second thing is, if you want to write this down, he offers him a friendship. He offers him a friendship. 
You see, in ancient times and also in many cultures around the world today, uh, you know, to share a meal together wasn't just about eating food. It was very much a symbol for, well, for unity, for uh, togetherness, for unity, for, for allegiance, for friendship. That's what Jesus is doing. He's offering a friendship. We're going to eat together. We're going to be friends, Zacchaeus. Notice Jesus doesn't say to him, hey, Zacchaeus, if you stop your stealing, maybe I'll talk to you. <laughs> no, he says, Zacchaeus, let's be friends. Let's be friends. And because Jesus did that, because he loved Zacchaeus as he was, that's why Zacchaeus also changed. He changed his ways. You see, that's the difference between religion, all the religions in the world, and the gospel of Jesus. There's a difference. In all the religions of the world, it's basically, the, the idea is, you have to get your act together, you have to be the best possible version of yourself, you have to abide by all the rules, you have to live right, you have to you know, be generous with the poor, and all that, you know, do good, be good, and then maybe you will get to God if he's merciful. The gospel says, God has come to you in the person of Jesus Christ to offer friendship. And it's not because of anything that you're doing so well, but because he's, he's coming, not because you're doing it right, but he's coming to make you right. That's, that's why. That's the gospel. So what does this mean for us at Mosaic? You know, here's what I've often seen. Oftentimes I've seen that in, in, in many of our churches that we actually look more like religion when we look like gospel. And when a new person comes in, we, we want that person to behave right. You know, wear the right clothes, pray the right prayers, act right, you know, be pure, all of that. We look at the behavior first. And then, oh, that person's behaving right? Okay, let's now look at what that person believes. Is it the right, is that person reading the right books? <laughs> is it the right doctrine? You know, and only if the person behaves right and believes right, then do we say, now you get to belong to our tribe. Now you are part of us. Behave, believe, belong. And here's what I think Jesus did. And I, we see this all over the Gospels. He's swapping the first one and the third one. He starts with friendship. He says, first of all, you get to belong to me. Let's be friends. Let's have a friendship. Let's have a relationship. And then as you get to know me, you will learn to trust me, to believe in me, to follow me. Believe. And then as you believe in me, I'm going to put my spirit in you. And that spirit is going to work on your behavior and take and turn around all the things that are so destructive in your life so that it's actually not just about behavior, it's about becoming. You will become who you're supposed to be. And then it is belong, believe, behave. You see, you cannot win an enemy for Christ, only a friend. And maybe you're saying, well, but hold on, what if that person doesn't behave right? What if he doesn't live right? Are we just then approving? Is Jesus not just approving the ways of Zacchaeus? No, he wasn't. Not once in this story do we see Jesus say, hey, well done, Zacchaeus, for stealing from your people. He isn't approving. <laughs> He's not approving anything. Uh, Jesus figured out a way to befriend people who did things that were not right in his eyes, but he did it anyways. He befriended them. I have never met anybody in my life who became a Christian because they were criticized. I have met loads of people in my life who became Christians because they were loved. Nobody gets Christians because they're criticized. People become Christians because they are loved, because of a friendship, because of a relationship. That is the Jesus way. That is the way of the way maker. That's what it means to be a friend of sinners. And Jesus, he was so welcoming. He was so gracious that the tax collectors and the sinners, they were gravitating to him. They were attracted to him like, you know, like mosquitoes and bugs are attracted to a light bulb at night. At the same time, Jesus was so welcoming and gracious that the religious people, they were questioning this gospel of grace 
to the point that they eventually were shouting, crucify him, crucify him. It's just too good to be true. We don't want this kind of teaching. Away with him. Crucify him. Jesus is a friend of sinners. And he invites you today to start a friendship with him. Not because of your morality. Not because of your ministry. Not, because, not on the basis of anything that you have done. But because he loves you just the way you are. There's a guy... Um, He's, he's already went to be with the Lord. His name is Brennan Manning. Uh, he, he was a Christian priest. And he was very honest about how he wasn't a very good priest. <laughs> uh, about his struggles with alcohol and, and all of these things in his life. And he wrote a book, brilliant book, called The Ragamuffin Gospel. I encourage you to pick up a copy of that book. And in it he writes, My deepest awareness of myself is that I am deeply loved by Jesus Christ. And I have done nothing to earn it or deserve it. Hmm. Jesus loved Zacchaeus just the way he was. But then he also loved him too much to leave him that way. So he didn't just offer him the gift of friendship. He also offered to him the gift of salvation. That's the third thing. Would you write this down? Jesus, he brings with him salvation. He brings with him salvation. People thought Zacchaeus was this wealthy man, but there was this one thing he did not have. And that's something his money couldn't buy. That's God's gift of eternal life. Let's read these last verses again. In eight, uh, verse 8, uh, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord. And if I have cheated people on their taxes, I, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save those who are lost. That was the mission of Jesus, to go after the lost. And that's the same mission that we have as a church, to go after the lost. Found people, find people. For the Son of Man came to save and seek those who are lost. And Jesus is saying here, salvation has come today to this home, to this home of Zacchaeus. Now it's really important that we get this. Zacchaeus was not saved because he made a promise to make things right again. He was saved because he received Jesus. He accepted and received the offer of Jesus. Okay? And, and Jesus, what he's doing here is when he's saying, oh, look, salvation has come, he's not pointing to the root of salvation. He's pointing to the fruit of salvation. Does that make sense? He's pointing, look, look, this, this life change that happened here. Something's different. This man's no longer the same. Life change has happened. This man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. Uh, Jesus isn't just talking about, you know, his ethnicity, you know, the ethnicity of Zacchaeus. He's talking about, this is now a son of faith, the son of the faithful Abraham. That's what he's saying. He's a true son of Abraham now. Jesus is saying, guys, can you see this? This man's no, more, no longer the same. He's changed now. The gospel is at work in him. He's shown himself to be a child of God now. Life change. He's no longer the same. Jesus is pointing to the fruit of salvation. Okay, so that's just the outcome. What was the root then? Maybe that's what you're asking. What was the root? How did salvation then come to the home of Zacchaeus? Well, salvation is a person. Salvation is Jesus. That is his name, his Hebrew name. His Aramaic name, Yeshua, means salvation. He is the Savior. How is he the Savior? Well, Jesus found Zacchaeus in a tree. But a few days later, about 10 days later, Jesus would be found hanging on a tree, on a cross. Mocked, ridiculed, laughed at, rejected. In 1 Peter 2, verse 24, it says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and then live to righteousness. 
By his wounds you have been healed. Salvation has come to the, house, to the home of Zacchaeus. Christ, the Savior, has come to his home. And, you, and, and Zacchaeus received him. And you know, it reminds me a little bit of a verse in the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 20, where Jesus says, look, I stand at the door and I knock. I think that's what Jesus might be doing in your heart right now. He's standing at your door and he's knocking. I stand at the door and I knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Jesus is offering to you today a friendship. He's calling you by name. He's knocking at your door. He wants to be your friend. And when he comes, he's going to bring salvation with him. Salvation that only he can bring. And it's not based on anything that you have done, that anything that you have to show. No, he sees you the way you are and he says, look, I, I'm going to bring the thing that you can never work for by yourself. I'm going to bring it to you as a free gift. Uh, maybe you want to receive this gift today and invite Jesus into your heart. And you're saying yes to this knock that you're hearing. Um, if that's you, I would love to lead you in a prayer right now. And you can just pray along in your heart, in front of your screen. I'm going to pray. And you can just pray along in your heart. And you just say, yes, yes, me too. What Dave's just praying, that is for me too. Okay, so let's pray together. Jesus, I thank you uh, for this story of Zacchaeus and that it's written down in the Bible and that we can learn and hear about it today. Thank you that you have reached this man who was hiding in a tree. He just wanted to, he was curious. He just wanted to have a look at you. And then the day changed and he found himself feasting with you and you brought salvation to his home. And Lord, that is something that I'm longing for as well. Just pray this with me, if, if maybe for the first time, maybe for the 500th time. Just pray, Lord, I, I want to say yes to this invitation of friendship. And I want to invite you. I want to invite you into my home. I want to invite you into my heart. I want to be your friend. Today, I decide or today I recommit my life to you and I want to follow you and help me in the days and weeks ahead. What that means on how I can do that. Uh, but that's my decision right now. I say yes to this gift that you have for me in Jesus' name. Amen.